cannot remedy the defects of the transaction in any way possible. That is why we question the transaction. In any case, what is government desperately looking for 500 million US dollars for? What do they want the money for? What is the national need? What is the emergency for which we must borrow? From a transaction that we end without borrowing, gold contributes 4% to our national revenue. Government with, with government without Ajapa earns 130 million US dollars annually from gold revenue and just 10 of the mineral mining companies make significant contribution to our total revenue. Parliament cannot remedy the defects so identified by the special prosecutor. How is Parliament going to cure nepotism and cronism? Mm. How is Parliament going to cure that you appointed a chief executive without due process? How is Parliament going to cure that you pass a resolution on a non-existing law? You don't build a house on nothing. It was built on nothing. So how is Parliament going to cure that a motion is moved and the motion is amended at the very time it was to be adopted to make room to wait for a president to ascend to uh, a bill so passed by Parliament? We feel strongly, strongly vindicated. Uh, the truth must always stand with the political minority at all times. And uh, Ghanaians will now understand why momentarily I lost my cool and temperament for an important national matter of this character and nature. You find a minister of state trivialize it with uh, Papano at that time, uh, not concerned about the weight and magnitude of this particular transaction. I don't know the content of the bag that is coming to us. If we assess it, I will believe that we can work on it. Uh, we, we will apply ourselves to it. But already uh, we have a tall order of business for us to um, process and indeed transact. If adding to it, we believe that it's possible, uh, so be it. If it's not possible, uh, we'll have to turn it away. But I don't know what it entails. So I cannot make any definitive pronouncement on that. Some say this shows Parliament didn't do a good job with the earlier that was approved. How does it show? How does it show? What's conclusive about it? Do they know better than we do know? Which? Thing is, you can't just conjecture from the top of your head. You your position is can, can I finish? I mean, sometimes these things are very preposterous. Somebody sits somewhere as making a definitive pronouncement. You ask him, have you seen it? I haven't seen it. There was a sense in, in critique when we agree or say we haven't seen it. Even me, I can, I can, I can tell you that I haven't seen the reference and the content. So how does somebody sitting somewhere who hasn't seen it, you know, condemn Parliament for uh, lack of diligence? So you heard the minority majority leader of parliament uh, there on this uh, conversation in terms of the deal going back to parliament. Uh, but even before it goes back to parliament, it was in parliament before. How did they miss all that the special prosecutor pointed out? Uh, that's, you know, the concentration here. And my guest in studio is the member of parliament for Tamale Central, uh, Mr. Inusa Fuseni. He also sits on a committee uh, that also monitor the process at the finance committee level. So this is very important. We will also be joined uh, via phone by Dr. Rashid Draman, Executive Director of the Institute of, uh, of the African Center for Parliamentary Affairs. He will join us uh, via phone for a perspective on this as well. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning, and how are you? Very well, thank you. Yep. And I, I know that the minority did boycott the process at some point uh, but beyond that help us appreciate how parliament couldn't figure out what the special prosecutor did 
Well, thank you so very much. Uh, let's backtrack. So, uh, on the Ajapa deal and all the documents uh, that came to Parliament on the transactions, came to Parliament on the 13th day of August 2020, with the executive approval from the President. And it was referred to the Finance Committee by the Speaker of Parliament. The Speaker of Parliament then uh, directed that the uh, Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee could be part of the committee to consider the, uh, the documents that were submitted to us by the Minister of Finance. So the minority uh, elected uh, Dr. Dominic Ayini, myself, Bernard Ahefo, and others to join the Finance Committee and the minority side of the Finance Committee to sit in to review the documents that were submitted to the House. Now, at the meeting, uh, one matter was very clear, was very clear. I mean, uh, and I, I say without any fear of contradiction that the matters contained in Martin Amidu's report were matters that had agitated the minds of the minority when we were before the Committee on Finance, considering the documents that came before Parliament. Now, the first most important matter, I mean, and it's a constitutional matter, the Constitution has an enacting formula for laws, and it's captured in Article 106 of the Constitution. Bills laid in Parliament, considered by Parliament, and passed by Parliament must be assented to by the President before they become law. And so until such a bill passed by Parliament is assented to by the President, you cannot have a law on which to stand to take decisions. And so uh, the Minerals Income and in Investment Fund Act, which was passed earlier on in the year, was brought back to Parliament by the Finance Minister even before the documents evidencing the transaction were laid. Now, in that bill, the, uh, the law had established a, a special purpose vehicle, SPV, mm -hmm. as an instrument mm -hmm. of the fund for the purposes of engaging outsiders, investors, in the uh, mineral royalties and income investment fund, in the fund. Now, the vehicle, the vehicle that is the SPV as the instrument, was totally owned by the fund. Now, the Minister for Finance introduced an amendment to Parliament to make the X SPV operationally independent of the fund. Meaning the SPV was going to be a legal entity with a life of its own. Now, we had misgivings uh, because we thought that the fund as a fund uh, to engage with outsiders could be difficult. And so that was why we needed an SPV. Now, the whole new amendment was taking the discussions beyond the uh, SPV being an instrument of the fund. But we were convinced that the good governance and other uh, dictates of the uh, international finance market, of which uh, the Minerals Income and Investment Fund intended to list Ghana's royalties, uh, needed the, an SPV which was not subject to the control of government. So we, have, we, we passed the amendment. But the amendment at the time that the documents were submitted to Parliament evidencing the transaction, the Ajapa deal, had not been assented to by the President. So there was no law on which to take a decision. Because I, mean, I, have a, I have a lot of follow-up questions to ask you. Yes. Because even though you boycotted the process at some point, you didn't make a strong case, as we've seen, and it wasn't so clear, your disagreements. But let me just bring in Dr. <laughs> Rashid Draman, Executive Director, African Center for Parliamentary Affairs. A very good morning to you, sir. Uh, thank you for your time, if you can hear me. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Is this how our parliament is supposed to be operating? This is a very important deal if you look at some of the basic things uh, that the special prosecutor pointed to, considering this deal went to parliament. Uh, shouldn't our parliament have pointed out these things? Uh, there was, and according to the special prosecutor, I'm quoting, reasonable suspicion of bid rigging, corruption and conflict of interest uh, in the selection process of investors. And this is the mandate agreement. Uh, and also pointing to the fact that it makes it an international 
business agreements, which had to go under Article 1815. My point is, all these things are passed by Parliament. All the other things should have been pointed uh, to when the deal went to Parliament. Why didn't we see our parliamentarians doing an effective job with the agreement that they had worked on? Yeah, well, uh, Mamavi, um, yes, this is not how our parliament should operate, or this is not how any parliament at all should operate. Regrettably, regrettably, I think we operate in a, in a system where most of the time, at the end of the day, it comes down to the numbers. When the right honorable speaker says all those in favor, you know, then we see issues, I mean, coming down to political division, regrettably. And this is this has been the trend over the years. I mean, I've heard uh, uh, my brother, the Honorable Indusa, taking the case. But, I mean, some might say that uh, maybe in the past when his own party was in government, we've seen instances where maybe uh, the minority at the time would vehemently disagree on a certain number of issues, but the majority would have its way. Uh, so I'm, I'm just making this point to say that, you know, as a country, we have to remember and our leaders have to always remember that at the end of the day, whatever decisions that they make uh, should be decisions that are in the interest of the people that they represent. Otherwise, we get to embarrassing situations like this. And then when something like this happens, you know, it's not only an indictment on the on the majority alone, because we say parliament, parliament has uh, disagreement. So for me, that is that is the, 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 the sad aspect that, I mean, on some very important national issues, I think our parliamentarians and our leaders must agree that here yeah, we have to put partisan interests aside and let's work for the nation, let's work for the people that, that we represent, the people that sent us to parliament. So, Dr. Draman, you know, the people are thinking, how many of these deals have gone through? I mean, how many of these deals have they passed without properly scrutinizing it? Should we have special prosecutor or any... Uh, an institution like that going back to all the agreements that Parliament should have scrutinized? I am worried, and there are people who are worried as well. If this is how they do their work, then why are they there? Well, I think in the, in, in the, in the case of this particular deal, I mean, I remember on your network as well as on many other networks, I mean, there were very strong voices, particularly from two society organizations that work in this, uh, in this particular field. And at the time, I was saying that when all these society organizations couldn't be wrong. And if we said, maybe, uh, as the argument was at the time, that the minority was raising some of the issues that they raised for political uh, gain, uh, you couldn't have about 25 society organizations, uh, no matter how someone would tag some of them, uh, you couldn't have all of them coming together uh, to to raise issues that were similar to, to those of the minority, you know. But, you know, having said that, Mamavi, I mean, you raise a very important point about, you know, how many of these uh, things have passed through our parliament without the hidden scrutiny. Uh, as a human institution, and the honorable is there in the studio to tell you. Um, I think that's why we have what we call post legislative scrutiny. I mean, it hasn't, it's not very, very common in our country, but in most countries, after every three years of implementing a particular law, you know, Parliament goes back, say, let's take this law, let's look at, you know, what the law was intended for in the first place, and after maybe a number of years, let's see what are 
looking back whether parliamentarians made the right decision and whether the law or whatever has, has addressed the gaps and the issues that uh, that I mean, was intended to address in the first place. So, I mean, this is the reason why we have something like this. So, it is possible that I mean, sometimes Parliament can get things wrong. And and, uh, and that is why the increase in post-legislative scrutiny for some of these uh, reviews to be done. But I think in instances where there are very strong voices, not only from the minority, but also from civil society organizations, from uh, people with expertise in a particular field. I think our members of parliament, both sides, must listen. And, and, and you know, we always also say that minorities change. Uh, I'm sure that if, if, we flip, if we flip the coin today, uh, we'll hear the same kind of voices from the, from the group that is majority today. And then we hear maybe a very strong support of government mm. from the group that is uh, that is minority today. And I think we have to get to a point, I mean, in our history, in our democracy, where these things must change. I mean, it's a political house, we understand. I mean, you know, when these debates happen, they couldn't be devoid of, of politics. Also, but I think, mm -hmm. yes. Now, I was just going to say, I know that you have to leave us, but I, I want to ask... In, in a situation where national interest has been comprom compromised by parliament, how do we punish parliament? Well, we punish parliament by, uh, unfortunately, I mean, we, 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 we can't, we don't have the power to do it frequently, but we have the power to do it every four years. And I think uh, in the next few weeks, you know, we, we have an opportunity to look at the work that I have got, our government has done, as well as the work that all our 275 members of parliament have done. Are, are then, you saying, Dr. Draman, that when they've allowed a deal like this to go through without proper, properly scrutinize it, with all the implications, the only thing we can do is to vote our individual MPs out of office after four years? Well, uh, Mawami, the other the other options that we have are uh, uh, perhaps maybe uh, uh, options that, that I would not call democratic. I mean, that would be maybe uh, taking some extreme measures. But citizens can, as we have seen in many countries, citizens can come out and, and, and demand change in a way that that sometimes uh, maybe could result in processes that are not democratic or uh, and those kind of processes could also lead to uh, what we have seen in some countries that we don't want to see. I mean, I don't want to mention I mean, certain words on your, on your platform, but I mean, what I am saying is that if we are unhappy with a government or a group that, that leads us, uh, one of the surest ways that we, we have to bring about change and to use the power of the vote that we have. There are other options, but uh, I think that that is up to citizens to... Uh, we can recall our MP, but in this case, we are talking about the whole parliament. We cannot mm -hmm. recall I mean, the, the 275 members of parliament. Well, D Dr. Draman, I thank you very much uh, for your time and your perspective to this. Dr. Rashid Draman is Executive Director, African Centre for parliamentary affairs, a man who is familiar uh, with how parliaments, particularly in this region elsewhere, operate. Uh, Mr. Anissa Fuseni, we should be ashamed of the work that you have done, irrespective of the fact that you are part of the minority uh, that dissented at some point in this process, shouldn't we? Well, I understand the sentiments expressed by Dr. Dramani. I also understand it and appreciate your views. but. We, to be fair to Parliament, and particularly the minority, these matter, matters were raised by the minority before the Committee of Finance considering the Ajapa deal. Now, and also, let's get it clear. It is the minority who raised strong objection to the Ajapa deal 
that caught the attention and scrutiny of civil society organizations. It is not civil society organizations who on their own started the scrutiny. It was because of the vehement opposition by the minority expressed on the floor of the house that got people thinking and looking into the deal. Now, I understand clearly that the ratification of the agreements was done by parliament. By parliament is duly constituted by the speaker, the majority members of parliament, the clerk, and the minority members of parliament. So parliament sitting is duly constituted when you have all these segments in place. The minority will have a position, but that position need not be the position of government. That position is decided on votes. And when that vote is taken, the vote, the decision becomes a decision of parliament. So that marks whatever, because of the democratic system that we're practicing, the, the vociferous objection of a minority in parliament can get drowned by the outcome of a vote. And this is what happened in Najapadia. First of all, let me tell you without any fear of contradiction that the minority raised the issue of procurement of the services of Imara Corporate Finance Services, a PT, T, PTY of South Africa. They demanded to see the letter from the PPA approving of such engagement. The minority wanted the finance minister to give the minority or the committee on finance an aggregation of the royalties that were to be lodged with the SPV. The minority stated that clearly on the floor of the house. The minority wanted to know the basis upon which we were running into this transaction in view of the fact that gold royalties are expected royalties that come to the country every year. And if you do the calculation, whatever amount of money that government was going to secure by scrutinizing our gold royalties could be obtained within two, three, or four years. Why would government pledge or scrutinize our royalties for a period of no less than 15 years. The issue with the Amara agreement, you raised that at the committee level. You said that yes. you wanted to see the document. Yes. Was it given? No. No, I mean, and, 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 and you can appreciate that from the report of the of special prosecutor. But even if you had been given, because from the special prosecutor's revelation, you would not have known that Data Bank... Was, we would not have was, known was because partnering with Imara we would not have known. So that is the value that has been added to the issues raised by the minority by the special prosecutor. Because the special prosecutor was not doing an investigative report into analysis of corruption, a risk of corruption, and anti-corruption, uh, 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 what we call assessment. I've got a question, though. So when you asked for these documents at the committee level and you were not given, what were your options then? After, we, what, what kind of option do you so have? We had no options than to debate the impunity on the floor of the house. Did you also spot the, the fact that this was an international agreement and so it needed the engagements of Imara? First and of so all, it needed to be brought to the first house? First of all, you, need, you can't build something on nothing. If Imara was not properly retained, then you don't even need an international agreement. You can, it can qualify as, a, as an international agreement. Prima facie, before an, a, an agreement can become an international agreement, the retention of that party must be in accordance with the laws of the country. And so if PPA, a PPA, a Public Procurement Authority, did not give permission or approval for the retention of Imara, then the retention of Imara itself was unlawful, violated the laws of the country. How, could a, how can a, 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 a legal agreement or an agreement that is unlawful be an international agreement? That was why you needed to satisfy yourself that they had gotten approval. Before you even come to the next step, 
of laying the agreement in Parliament. But we didn't get the approval. So my question is, why didn't we see, we know, yes, you disagreed. You said, and, the, and to be fair, there are things that when the minority says it is politicized, so people say, oh, there they go again. Again. Aha. Uh -huh. But my point is, I'm not sure you made it so clear the things that you disagreed on so that Mama, people, the people of Ghana could follow your Mama arguments. V, I'm just inviting you to go to Parliament, pick the Hansard of 14th of August 2014, and read the comments of the minority. It was I, I mean, and, and I, when they moved the motion, was so overtaken with emotion that I got up and caught the eye of the speaker. And I invited the speaker to consider seriously what we're doing in that house on that day. Because I was left in no doubt that what, was do what we're doing was unconstitutional. I read the provision of the constitution to the speaker and interpreted the cons constitution, I mean the provision to the speaker, because we had amended the law. So we could not say that we didn't know that the law was amended. But most importantly, the report of the committee made reference to the law that had been amended. That law, that amended bill, had not been assented to. So you could not be taking a decision on it. So that is why when we walked out, when we did we set all these things on the floor of the house and walked out, not the uh, resolution that was passed. The resolution was passed Get creating uh, uh, what we call in law uh, speculative jurisdiction in parliament. And parliament has no speculative jurisdiction. The resolution says that the Ajapa deal will come into force when the amended uh, uh, provisions are assented to by the president. You don't have, parliament doesn't have speculative jurisdiction. I mean, because you can't assume that the president will assent to the bill. And so you, you can see even from the resolution that after we left, the minority, the majority thought that something was fundamentally wrong. And they thought the way to address that thing or to resolve what was wrong was to pass a speculative resolution. Here's my worry, though. This is a very important deal. Yes. Something that commits the states. Yes. And is long term. Yes. Um, you pointed to some disturbing facts in the agreement. Yeah. Was your only resolution a walkout because the majority would not listen? Because, you know, the people put you there to do a piece of work. And even though you share your views when you disagree, I think I have an issue of, is your only option walking out and saying they won't listen to us, so we don't want to be a part of it? Mavi, I tell you here on set, I was the first person to walk out. When I made the submissions on the unconstitutional acts that we were engaging in, and speaker overruled me, I said I will not be part, a party to this unconstitutionality, and I walked out. But obviously, that's not the solution. Well, but what, what do you do? Because the special prosecutor no, had not no, gone, so gone the, into this with his corruption risk assessments. I can tell you as a fact that if special prosecutor had not gone into this and there was a change or there is a change of government, that agreement would have been subject matter of investigation. And any investor investing in the Ajapa royalties based on the resolution that was passed in parliament would have been doing so at his own risk. Because they were simply, you think that investors are fools? There was simply no basis for the Ajapa deal ratification in parliament. So we wait for a deal to go through and pray and hope that there will be a change in government so we can reverse it. But what do you do when government is bent on perpetuating an impunity? What do you do? You start with cordials? You turn the parliament into a brawl? What do you do? You walk out and refuse to be part of the process. That's what you do. And walk out is an, a, a, a legitimate expression of dissent in parliament. It's a tool available to members of parliament. My worry is when you walk out, the deal is still passed. Yeah, it will be passed. It will be passed. In fact, that, that even aggravates the level of impunity. It only shows that with the parliament presently constituted, 
by 169 members of parliament from the majority and 106 members from the minority, they do not need the minority to pass resolutions. Is parliament reflecting on the poor job done and regretting? Or you're simply looking forward to because the new debate now is it should come back to parliament. Well, you don't, you don't, you can't remedy an irretrievably bad deal. It's a rotten deal. If something is rotten, you throw it away. And if you want that system, you start afresh. You don't, you, this deal is irretrievably bad. The mandate form, by, by, according to the special prosecutor, was signed by the deputy minister for finance. When he had no power. But you didn't spot it. We didn't spot it because they didn't bring the mandate. We didn't spot it. How can you spot something which was not presented to you? Was it even fair that you had 24 hours to look at this all-important deal? Well, that is how government used to act that day. That was the day we were rising. We were rising the day. I mean, the next day, they brought it the day before the rising. And, and that was how government used to conduct its business. You know, we're using this one agreement. But it, this has happened many times, hasn't it? This happened many times. And that's why I am terribly disappointed in Nana Adonan Kakufadu. So many years ago, this country came to the conclusion that the political constitution that we're running could not secure as the necessary development. That it was important to move the political constitution to a development constitution. That parliament was weak, largely because the majority of ministers were drawn from parliament. The constitutional amendment, I mean, constitutional amendment review commission made recommendations to free parliament from the bondage of the executive. The president came into office, met the recommendations of the Constitutional Review Committee, decided to ignore it with impunity. That's why we are where we are. So you will find the majority members of parliament, and particularly your colleague, who is information minister, who is a member of parliament, who under normal circumstances will scrutinize a government deal. He trivialized the debate and introduced words which were unparliamentary in parliament. That is the conflicted situation in which the provision that allows the a, a, a president, the executive, to appoint majority of his ministers from parliament. That's what happens. Because you wouldn't expect a minister of state who is part of the executive to argue with dispassionate emotion on the matter and put national interest at the forefront in his debate. Because it, on one leg, he's standing with the executive. On the other leg, he's standing with parliament. So when said people move parliament into passing a resolution to favor the executive, you obviously blame parliament. But you don't see the conflict. And that is what happened. Now, as you've been in parliament, and what has been the conversation you know, amongst parliamentary, are, are you regretting what you have done? Are you ashamed? The, I, I am ashamed. I, as a person, am ashamed because I have always the conversations. Uh, 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 well, I can tell you the conversations, uh, private conversations that we have with each other, clearly, clearly point to the fact that certain activities, I think that they ought not to pass through parliament. I mean, we had a uh, parliamentary training institute organize a seminar for members of parliament. As leadership of parliament in that meeting Kujon Pianin came to address us made some revelations about matters that we had passed in that meeting in that meeting all the people they resolved that things were not good the way they were going but we came back and we saw the same things because even if a person is not if a member of parliament is not a minister he's working to catch the eye of the president so he will not stand in his way when he wants things done in parliament. Then that can never be that resolved. Is, even, can if, never even, be, even if, even if uh, we amend uh, our laws, that no, can never that be, resolved. be resolved. That will be resolved. How can that be resolved? That will be resolved if you don't have a majority of ministers from parliament. That will be resolved even if you have a president who is prepared to say, look, people get elected into parliament because they want to be legislators. If you, uh, if you want to be a minister, don't seek appointment to parliament. This abrasion that we have was because of an experience we had in the Third Republic. That President Liman's budget could not be passed. And so when we had opportunity to write a new budget, 
we thought that if a majority of ministers were members of parliament, then you already had majority of, I mean, of your ministers supporting the, the, the budget or a government policy. And so that is an aberration. And that, I mean, that is what is now militating against our development. So I, I said, and I, I'll give you another example. PCO4, P you remember him? Mm -hmm. In the history of parliament, he is the only member of parliament who stood up against government policy when government was privatizing Vodafone. You know the consequences of that? He was removed on all boards. All boards. He never got an appointment. And even still suffering the consequences of that action under this government. What's the usefulness of parliament right now? Uh, there's, there cannot be a democracy without parliament. Unless you don't understand what democracy means. So there cannot be a democracy without parliament. There can be a government without parliament. That government can never be called a democracy. So is it just for in, in, in terms of functioning? in the name and the distribution. There's an executive, there's a judiciary, and there's the, there's the legislature. Is it only existing in, no, in its name like no, that? No, no. People must have the power, authority, and right to determine who leads them. And to do that, they must have the right to speak on matters that touch and concern their lives. So they elect their representatives to scrutinize government policy and make available to government resources. But you have failed on that aspect. We have failed because of the institutional mechanisms that we have, the government's, government architecture that we have put in place. I always say as a student of politics that the experience in the Third Republic ought to have guided us in a way that, that would not make us loosen or weaken parliament in this bid to hold the executive accountable. And listen to me, parliament holding the executive accountable. That is a trite understanding of what legislatures all around the world do. But what do we see in Ghana? When we say holding executive accountable, more often than not, it is the minority that holds the executive accountable. Even that, when issues come and it has to do with you, we're talking about money and salaries, you are usually with them. Nowhere on earth is government run by conflict. Government everywhere is run by consensus and negotiation. It is only when you, you fail to agree or reach a consensus on a matter of national imp uh, importance that the conflict explodes. I've got a, a last angle to this, and this is the final one. Has Parliament learned any lessons from this deal? I hope so. Is it obvious in Parliament? Well, it's not yet obvious in Parliament, but I hope the Parliament has learned useful lessons. It pains. It pains. This is why members of Parliament sometimes are looked on as people who are with the greatest of respect to members of Parliament, comica. Because people know, all of us know individually, members of parliament as individually constituted have some level of understanding of what they think is best for this country. But acting collectively, we tend to subordinate our acknowledgement of the fact of things that ought to secure the well-being of the people of this country to the political party consider or partisan considerations and that is why on a daily basis or on activity basis we always lose respect i mean you will not say that in this parliament members of parliament do not have the skill understanding and analytical intellect to consider and dispassionately review government policy you, you will not say that but how come that when government policy is introduced into the house, we take partisan positions? How? Hmm. Just a curious case, uh, the Minerals uh, Income Investment Fund. Was this something that uh, was brought to the attention of Parliament? Was this something that you also looked into? 
Yes, we, 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 we worked on it and passed the law. The fact that persons heading the fund, was it something that came up as the special prosecutor has they, pointed to? They buy Article 195 of the Constitution. If you are establishing a statutory body, it must have a governing board. So we provided for a governing board. Okay. But in terms of its constitution? In, in terms of those who will constitute the governing board, parliament does not decide that or determine that. It okay. is the prerogative of the president. Okay, because I ask that because of what the special prosecutor, you know, yes, because his conclusion in terms of where they are, the fact that they are aligned yeah, with the MPP, be, so MPP, their decisions will so be... So their decisions will be clouded and that lowered the risk of corruption and also the anti-corruption But clearly assessment. that was not something that Parliament was concerned with. Parliament established a governing board and provided for qualification and criteria for selection of people onto the governing board. The president decided to exercise his executive authority under Article 58 and 195 to select persons onto the government board, a governing board. And in selecting persons, the president skewed, his choice was skewed towards people who shared in his political beliefs. Oh, Mercedes Afuseni. I want to say thank you, but I'm not sure I'm so hopeful in terms of the work of Parliament as Parliament is constituted you know, now, as in the structure that we have going forward. I, I have a feeling that we will see this happen again and again, and I we will continue to have this I conversation. I understand and appreciate your despondency, your worry and concern. I, simply, I, I totally understand. I understand because of the present situation in which we find ourselves. I just hope that we will learn useful lessons from what has happened and take remedial and corrective steps to ensure that it never happens. That is the, that's a hope, but it's a very, very uh, faint hope because the governor's architecture clearly conduces to such arrangements. You know, one of the men that will miss in parliament is you. Mr. Yunus Afusaini, because yes, apart but, from this conversation, you've been very objective on other matters as well. And it's sad that such good men were losing in Parliament. But we wish you well. We've already had our exit interview, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, 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 that's okay, that's okay. But uh, I, I, we are always available. I mean, you see, we, learn, we must learn as a people to put the country first in terms of matters that affect us. Sometimes I lie down and I say that, look, Nana Adedonka Kofado has not helped us. Because as a did, lawyer... Did, did John Drama ma help no, us? No, why? Why? Because Nana Kofado had opportunity to review what John Dramani Mahama was doing. And in, review, in his revision of what John Dramani Mahama was doing, he came up with things that he thought he could do differently. It caught the imagination of the people of this country. And unfortunately, Nana Adodanka Kofado has reversed on all that he said he would I'm do. I'm sure if I spoke to the other side, they would disagree with uh, you. But I mean, thank you so much for your we time. We said we won't do family thank and friends you. government. It was one of the key things. We said we won't appoint... You said minutes. before, you're saying now? No, they said, they said they wouldn't do. He said he wouldn't do family and friends. He said it. Did and you? everybody thought that family and friends in government is a sure recipe for disaster. Because you are not. Did able... you do family, family and That's what he not? said. Because there was one I'm family and I'm member. talking about you. No, there the was NDC. one family member of uh, John Draman and Mahama in his government. That was enough to qualify his government as a family and friends. There was only one family member. We'll leave it here. Thank you so much. Mm. We will talk about the US elections before show business. Stay with I us. Wish, I wish Biden well. Really? Yes.